Thank you. Right. Good afternoon. Um, so this topic is a debatable topic, and I, I heard one or two hard questions to Bob earlier. So my approach is that there isn't something you know you must do or mustn't do. It's more of creating an awareness about sustainability and the way we do things when we um, uh, adopt serverless. So that's the way we should take this, and that's what I'm trying to convey to give you some of the, you know, the best practices or uh, patterns or places that we need to be a bit, uh, you know, uh, careful of and conscious and aware of when it, when it comes to sustainability. And also, I will give you a different uh, element of sustainability as well. Um, it's, it's glad to be here because this is second time standing on this podium here in this room because uh, I was here 2018, 2019, the previous edition, I was talking about the serverless costing at that time. Um, my name is Sheen Brussels and uh, I currently work for the Lego Group and I'm a serverless hero because I, I talk about serverless and I write about serverless a lot, so, you know, humble recognition. and. Um, you can, you can, you know, follow me and uh, read a bunch of blog posts I write. Um, when, I, when, I, when I talk about serverless across, uh, across different, you know, places and conferences, and I, when I say that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Lego group, I usually get two questions. The first question is, how much of, uh, you know, uh, serverless is at the Lego group? And because people think that, uh, you know, everything is serverless and that's why this guy is talking about serverless, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not true. If you, you know, if you, if you, have, you know, if you take any big corporation, it has multiple divisions, big divisions. So we have, uh, you know, digital technology organization, which is kind of, you know, broken down into uh, different big departments. Uh, I come from uh, the division called Marketing Channels Technology, what we call MCT, which is a number of domains, and under each domain we have, oops, um, plenty of squads, product squads, that are smaller squads. So that's sort of the setup. So if you take MCT, most part of MCT you will fi find serverless somewhere. So some squads are heavily into serverless because they focus on APIs or backend specific services, whereas uh, uh, some squads, like if you take a checkout squad, they have a bunch of you know sort of front end aspects as well as the backend APIs. So you will have you will have some sort of sort of a full stack team there, and also there are squads that interact with the third parties. So for marketing emails and other things, so they may have you know, the other application, external parties, application, as well as serverless, enabling them to work with those things. So that's sort of the, you know, the limit within which we work. Outside of MCT, another organization, other departments and divisions, they also do serverless across the Lego group, but equally you'll find containers and Kubernetes and traditional legacy SAP setup and all sorts of things as you can imagine in a big corporate. The second question I often have is, how much of lego.com is serverless? Because this is what I always preach about, the lego.com and the experience we've been through adopting or migrating lego.com onto serverless. And uh, to give you that answer, so this is uh, lego.com uh, front page. And uh, this is a typical, very high level architecture of lego.com. And uh, this box around, this, if you take this is the backend, that backend is made of 100% serverless microservices. So that means if you visit the site, drop things onto a basket, complete your checkout, make your payments, and finish your order, everything is handled by serverless services behind the scene. So if you think of, you know, if you hear people, if you're new to serverless, and if you hear people saying that our oh, serverless is, you know, good for some sort of, you know, back and back job or uh, that sort of things. So here we are talking about customer facing, client facing, you know, fast response to application running on serverless. So the front end is on Fargate and, uh, you know, the bunch of web technologies. Okay, so what is sustainability? Now, it means different things to, you know, different people. But at the moment, when you say sustainability, you think about environment, right? 
So the environment we live in, we need to be, you know, sort of green energy and all sorts of things. That's true, because that's where the focus is. That's the damage we are trying to limit or make it better for future generations. It's because if you think of the definition of definition in the sense, the way of defining it, sustaining is is not just about environment. Sustaining is a kind of a process of keeping something going with the necessary nourish nourishments and things like that. That's exactly what we are doing when we say, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the green initiatives or the environmental aspects and all sorts of things, so that we can keep the world going for longer period. Because if you apply this principle, you can see that sustainable environment, financial sustainability, sustaining life, our own life, so the things that we do, like you know, the, 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 the food habits or the, the, the keep fit uh, you know, regimes and all sorts of things, and also the sustainable transport system and cities, how they become sustainable. So it's basically applicable to many aspects around the world and our life and the environment becomes part of it because we are part of the environment. Now, if you look at uh, Wikipedia, you'll find three pillars of sustainability. And uh, social, economical, and environmental sustainability. These three are interrelated because if we take the social well-being, that has an impact on environment. Because if you think of the social well-being of a developing nation, their impact is, you know, the, the sustainable environment is different from a developed nation. They have different problems to solve. Even though we say we're a developed nation, we're doing all sorts of things, there are a bunch of other things to deal with when we come back to a developing nation. So this is the reason why they kind of say that this, you know, kind of all three uh, pillars are interrelated. Now, this is not about, you know, the world and environment. This is a serverless and a cloud, so let's move on. So when we look at the main cloud elements, there are three things. And uh, I mean, leave, uh, leave aside all the, you know, the buildings and the infrastructures and things like that. Main things like uh, compute, storage, network. This is kind of, you know, defines the whole of the, you know, the, the base of uh, cloud. Now, think of a situation like uh, you sitting in the office, you know, opposite your colleague, for example. In a good old day, if you've been to a, a you know, holiday and if you want to share a, you know, a few pictures with your colleague, what you do in the recent past, you copy them onto a USB stick, right? Going back, it could be a CD, or in my old days, it could be a floppy disk. I mean, you know, no one kind of knows those kind of things. But that's how we used to share. These days, things change. So I came back from a family holiday last night. That's why I wasn't here this morning. Um, so these days, we upload things to cloud, right? So all our photos end up somewhere. And if you want to share the photo with your colleague, what we do, we kind of, you know, share. What happens? It kind of sends a link to your photos or some, somewhere and that then gets delivered to your colleague and uh, your colleague clicks on that link and downloads the photo, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the two meter distance between yourself and your colleague now could be either 200 kilometers or miles or 2,000 or 20,000 miles, we don't know. And all the, you know, the round trip it takes, at every point there is storage, to have the things maintained, you need to have compute power. And of course, the network traffic that happens all over the world, okay? So this is what happens nowadays. And this is an example of why sustainability is talked about in the cloud world, because at all the, in those junctions, they all consume power. They don't just operate without power, right? Because compute and everything needs power. And that's one of the main reasons why we need to kind of understand 
and apply the necessary patterns and practices to minimize or eliminate wherever possible the impact of the environmental impact. Now, moving on to sustainability and serverless, because serverless is on you know, cloud, right? So, obviously. Now, there, there are three things I'm gonna focus here. One is the sustainability of the product. What is a sustainable serverless product? And the other one is the processes that we need to use to help building sustainable products in a sustainable way. And of course, the final one is the cloud. That's where we deploy and operate all our serverless applications. And that obviously takes the bulk of the environmental aspects when it comes to cloud. And the other two are in a slightly different tension. I will explain what I mean by a sustainable product. So what I call is a sustainability triangle in serverless. The first one is the products, and then the processes, and of course the cloud. What do I mean by the products? So sustainable serverless solutions, I'll explain in a minute. And then the processes that help us develop these uh, the, the products in a sustainable way and operate them in cloud. And then the practices and the patterns that we follow when we operate the serverless services in the cloud, okay? Different way of doing things from our legacy ways, okay? Now, why does it matter is because if you're familiar with the, the typical waterfall uh, development cycle, so this is pretty much what you will get. So you get requirements, you go through all the phases and you get to the you know, release phase and then straight on to maintenance. Now, that's the kind of the old way of thinking. But now with Agile and everything, so there's a different model. So you get the requirements or an idea, you do a quick design and build, you, what you're building is, is not the complete product, right? You, you build your MVP or the minimum viable thing. So that gets built, and then you kind of deploy or offer the service to your customers as the base version, then keep on iterating and improving. So that means you are sustaining the product to keep it going for long. So this is what I mean, the sustainable product, serverless you know, application or a product. Now, the olden way is kind of a big bank. If you're familiar with uh, you know, the, the typical um, uh, the, the cycles, you have a few weeks or months cycle, then that's how it goes. And it's kind of, uh, you know, um, you, you just do it and then it's kind of dead. Because if you're familiar with those days, you, you spent months building a product. When you released, it goes to the maintenance mode, right, after that. For maintenance mode, there is a separate team. They do the, you know, the, the bug fixes and things like that. And if you have anyone visiting your office, you are kind of, you know, bringing visitors and taking around. You often introduce all your big, you know, big shots like, you know, this is Bob, not not the other Bob, but um, you know, it's the you know chief architect and things. So here is Jane. She, he, you know, leads the cutting edge team, etc. Then someone will be popping up over there and say, oh, those guys, you know, this is a maintenance team you will find the maintenance team as the most demotivated team in a company because that's how it used to be, right? Now, luckily, I'm glad that this changed because these days we don't do that. We like kind of keep it going. We, we are always kicking alive. So that's the way, that's the new trend of doing things. We, we gone away with the siloed specialist. Now it's kind of full stack and uh, diverse. Um, when it comes to serverless, I talk about one of the strengths of serverless is engineering diversity. It's because I say that for a purpose, because olden days, or you know, the, the other way of working is, so if I'm familiar with C++ or Java or C Sharp or whatever, I am so good at it, that's it, I, you know, I, I get the requirements or ticket or whatever, I do the implementation, deploy, et cetera, et cetera, that's fine. But these days, when we work with cloud serverless, our reach of technical knowledge goes beyond the programming language. I need to know how to set up my queue 
how to adjust the queues parameters. I need to know how to secure my Lambda function or the table. I need to know how to you know, provision a, a uh, NoSQL table or DynamoDB table and set up its partition keys, indexing, all sorts of things. And I need to, I need to know how to set up my CI-CD pipeline. I need to know how to deploy the production. I need to know how to look after my product. I need to know how to observe things. All these things now part of engineer's job. That's why I say that serverless is kind of, you know, making it's a diverse engineering team uh, made. So that's why I say that it requires this mindset shift to, uh, to see the products as event-driven services. I, I know Bob talk a lot, talked a lot about the event-driven um, um, the nature earlier. So this is how it is. This is how the serverless, you know, the product's being developed. Now, um, if you are, if you, if you're, in a, you know, an organization or a team, how do you identify a product that can be sustained? It's simple. Okay, you organize few engineers together and tell them that, okay, guys, the, here is a product that we need to add a feature or add something or extend something. Okay. And if you hear any of these things coming out of those uh, engineers, then you know there is a problem, okay? It's a typical everyday language you hear in a team. And if you hear this final thing, it's a piece of, you know, beep, beep, then you definitely know that it's a no-go area for any engineer to touch. Why? Because the characteristics of a sustainable products main three main things, in my opinion. First one is modularity. Again, Bob talked about domain-driven design and the boundaries and the context and all sorts of things. They matter when we build modular applications. The second one is extensibility. These two go together. If you, know, if, you, if you don't build a model application, you can't extend. If you want to extend, you need to be modular. And the final one is observability, very important. You need to know exactly what happens in your application. It's not somebody else's job these days to look after your product. It's the team that you know, uh, builds, the, builds the product, builds, builds the serverless application. They run the product, so that is the way things are. So these are the main characteristics of sustainable application, in my opinion. And if you look at the processes, these are the methods and the tools that help us, you know, uh, build and operate uh, sustainable applications. So, simple things like uh, here we say, you know, people, the processes, and the, you know, of course, the cloud comes in. So, in other words, the mind or the, you know, the thinking and the, you know, the method and the, you know, the the, the, the machine. So, all kind of kind of, you know, saying the same thing, but the. The thing is, like, the way we come into the picture and how we make use of the processes and tools and how we kind of, you know, enable cloud, you know, operate in a sustainable way. Okay, so here are a few things. So, um, you must be fam familiar with the lean principles and how to reduce the, you know, the sort of a value stream, uh, the increase the value stream and things like that. So, that's very important. So, because if you if we kind of reduce the waste or uh, reduce wait, wait time, for example, for a, for a deployment, that means you are not consuming um, resources for longer. So you're consuming for shorter, that means you're consuming less power and all sorts of things. So that's why I, I, I mentioned the lean, uh, you know, the principle. And agile and practical, so starting something small, don't go, you know, big bang, because these days that's the pattern, like uh, you s start small and you trade slowly evolve. So that, that means, you know, incrementally you can see uh, the, the benefits. Uh, of, the, of the product that we are developing. And automation, I don't need to say anything, automation is the key, you know, that reduces uh, the waste and kind of gets the things done and that's it. Um, throw away prototype, this I think, uh, if you've been through the, you know, a few years ago in this, in, in the industry, prototyping used to be a thing, right? Because for everything that we do, we used to prototypes, like, a, you know, simple GUIs or all sorts of things as we used to do. What happens with prototypes, we, most of the cases, we just throw away the prototype. We just don't make use of because they don't represent anything because they're just dummy figures, right? But 
think about serverless or modern cloud applications, you are basically doing a prototype which basic will become your MVP. So with a bit of a thinking, we can clearly make a start of our real application with a simple prototype. That means in majority of cases, we don't need to throw away the prototype. We can simply build on top if we got a bit of you know, thinking and planning earlier. So that's what I you know, talk about, don't throw away the prototype. And uh, minimum viable I mentioned, to gradually progress it to make it uh, you know, another MVP, which is the maximum valuable product. Okay, and finally, um, yeah, uh, Bry came in earlier, previous talk, so do, do reuse yourself wherever possible. I mean, it's not possible always, but uh, you know, that's something we can think of. And uh, longevity, that's, I, you know, that's the sustainable product. If you're you know, in a DDD, Eric Evans talks about supple design, so that's kind of design that you can kind of keep it going or extend. So, these are the things, and finally, growing serverless teams. That's the sustainability in terms of your organizational, um, you know, brain power. I, I do a different talk on growing serverless uh, teams. This is an important aspect, if especially in an, in an organization where there is a need for serverless adoption and serverless engineering, serverless knowledge try to grow the team rather than just you know bringing in external knowledge and doing the things and kind of you know dismantling it so that's where you get a sustainable serverless knowledge base going okay so moving on to the cloud now um, so if you think of cloud aws uh, you know came up with a sort of a shared model similar to how they uh, talk about the security for, for serverless also the responsibility is shared because as a cloud provider, they can only do uh, you know, up to some extent. And it's, it's beyond that, they're just offering the cloud services to us and it's our responsibility to take those on board and then do our bit on top of. So that's why they say that uh, um, their job is you know, the look, doing the sustainability on the cloud, whereas our job as consumers of those services is to uh, do the sustainability in the cloud. So that means the, the, the service or the applications we develop and deploy and operate and how we do that. So that's kind of the difference. It's basically a different uh, interpretation of the shared, uh, shared sustainability model. So if you th take on the left side, so, uh, the uh, the renewable energy and the green energy, those kind of things should come from uh, the cloud provider, AWS and others, right? Whereas on the other side, uh, how do we kind of, you know, uh, develop the service of which, you know, the practices we use, and that's up to us. How do we maintain the data? How do we keep hold of the data? I'll talk about that in a minute. So those are the things up to us. So in the, in the cloud, so there are five main things I will briefly touch on. Um, First thing is the user behavior. So this is related to the, you know, the, the customers and uh, things around that. Then the architecture we use that kind of you know, promotes sustainability uh, in the cloud. And data and storage plays a very, very important role um, in the whole sustainability um, ecosystem. And of course, the compute and infrastructure, another key aspect of it, and then the development deployment, which partially we touched on in the previous slides. Um, if you think of user behavior pattern, I think the, the first and foremost is going serverless. Because serverless already gives you a step ahead when it comes to sustainability because of all the, you know, the, the characteristics of a serverless, you, you know, you heard about uh, um, uh, scale to zero and uh, on-demand compute and et cetera, et cetera. That means we are not kind of running um, containers or servers uh, uh, without any, you know, purpose or anything. We just use uh, when we need it. Um, so the, if, we, if you think of the patterns, uh, the 
the, the, you know, the practices. Understanding the customer you know, uh, demand and how we kind of cope with that, um, the demand and uh, provision the necessary uh, resources. For example, serverless already gives us, but uh, in some cases, when you're in a uh, massive you know, serverless scale operation, um, you need to kind of provision some things for your, uh, you know, a big sale event or a Black Friday or things like that. So in sort of occasions, you need to work with a cloud provider to, you know, plan for that, plan for the high traffic events and uh, keep, you know, so that that, get, that gives you the, the optimum use of the services rather than kind of, you know, keeping things on for 24-7, for, for example. And, um, Taking so, uh, you know the services close to customer base is uh, something very very common. Like we all hear about the edge computing, all sorts of things. So that basically reduces the traffic round you know round trip and all sorts of things. So that's another. I'm not saying that we you know we should do this because in certain cases we can't because there are restrictions, uh, legal restrictions, and you can't simply take data from one continent or country to another and you know, there are, there are a bunch of things, but wherever possible, and if possible, these are the things that we can, you know, kind of uh, look into when it comes to user behavior pattern. So data and storage, I mentioned, is an important, uh, uh, important uh, aspect of this whole sustainability in the cloud. Now, the first thing is, if you don't need data, just don't keep it. Whether it is, uh, you know, 1KB or, uh, you know, uh, petabytes of data because that's that's how it is like you know we can easily kind of dot tables around unused forever we don't touch it just just get rid of them there's no need and the other important aspect is like uh, data is everything right people say data is gold and uh, we consume data in i don't know terabytes petabytes or the maximum kind of bytes but thing is not all data remains gold forever. They become dust at some point. That's when we need to identify when the gold data becomes dust and that's when it can be kind of, you know, removed, for example. Because you use it for processing, for business analytics or insights and all sorts of things. And the big part of the data probably you don't need any longer. That's just operational data. Just don't keep it. because. You know, it's just waste. Waste in the sense is taking, I mean, you can say that, okay, it's a DynamoDB table or a S3 bucket, et cetera, but remember, it is, you know, occupying some space somewhere in a cloud environment. Um, so what are, the, what are the things that we can do? First thing is data store selection. Identify the data store that is best fit for the data. There's no point in putting data in S3 and uh, doing Athena to query all over the place when you can simply store in a SQL or NoSQL database and use efficient queries, right? So those are the things that you need to be mindful of. And uh, the data transition, this is another important thing. So there are a number of ways we can identify and set up uh, data to be removed or transition to different storage. And that can be made use of. I mean, not, ma not many people do that. So, you know, that's an important aspect that we need to. And uh, data movement, again, similar. So, when, when, when the, you know, it's uh, cross-region replication, I mean, it's unavoidable because we need to also think of the, um, the, the, the product's uh, availability, high, high availability, other things. But wherever possible, you know, make use of. That's why I said earlier on when I started, it's not something like must do or mustn't do. There's always some balance we need to kind of think of. Um, the, the data life cycle. So this is again another place where people don't, uh, you know, properly identify. Say for example, um, storage first pattern is a very popular in event-driven architecture. Who knows storage first pattern? So it's basically, you know, event comes and goes to the service. The first thing you do is store the data and then operate. So that means, you know, kind of you're not holding on to the things. The thing is, when you store that operational data and you use it for compute or for whatever your reason, 
and then you 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 made use of it, and that's it. You don't you no longer need to keep it. Okay, so that's 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 another uh, area that you can think of to remove uh, once this job is done, for example. And the data removal, again, there are a number of ways, the TTLs all over the place in different uh, data stores we get. Okay, so the next one is architecture. So decoupled event-driven architecture, everybody knows, and to manage services is a step closer because if you think of managed services, let's say DynamoDB is a massive scale you know, a managed service provided by AWS, right? They do everything behind the scenes as possible to make it sustainable and kind of, you know, all the ways to operate. Now, when we make use of it, we are already kind of being part of that movement that happened. So then on top, how we make use of the TTLs or the transitions and how we index and query and things is up to us, right? So this is the same with uh, many of those, most of them uh, managed services. So that's another reason why I said earlier that you know, we're kind of, when doing serverless, we're already first uh, one step ahead. Um, the pattern, so event-driven microservices pattern, that's something you know, simple, um, you just do one thing and then you know, build on or extend. And uh, queues, smooth, you know, they, 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 they give you uh, the, the kind of uh, option to smoothen the workload. Why I mention here is because, say you have a sudden spike, okay, and there is no need to uh, provision that many kind of service instances or whatever, Lambda functions for that particular things, for example. Now, if you don't smoothen that, that means your cloud provider, AWS, going to provision that many containers or services to cope with the traffic, right? But if we can smoothen with a queue, that means they don't need to. They can, you know, use their algorithms to kind of, you know, operate with the existing shared, you know, shared resource, sharing resources to cope with that. So that's another reason, wherever possible, um, you can use the queues or the other services, uh, the streaming services and things like that to kind of, you know, uh, the, the smoother uh, the load. And um, granularity, um, Bob talked about uh, small is uh, beautiful, I think. I am a great fan of granularity in serverless. I, I know there's a, a draft, a half written blog somewhere um, on granularity. The reason I say granularity is that with serverless, we can go down deep on different things. So we talked about queues, right? So if, we, if you're familiar with SQS, you know that if you had two different queues, you can tune them separately, right? You can, you can set the batch size differently. You can set the, I don't know, the, the visibility timeout differently. You can set up the message delay separately, differently. So that means you can set one queue as a fast queue, one queue slow. Imagine you had dozens of different SQS queues. Each one can be, you know, tuned. Same with Lambda function. You don't kind of set one memory, you know, setting for everything, right? DynamoDB table, go down deep. You can have on-demand for one table, provision for the other one, and you can set up, uh, you know, the, the TTL and different parameters. So security, another area where we can go. So that's why the serverless promotes granularity, you know, uh, deeply. So that's another important aspect. Um, so deletion, I already talked about, and uh, just to record the data, so that, you know, we talked about then the batch job. So this is another area where uh, if, you, if you have sort of a batch job, so for example, um, we, we have a payments, uh, payments microservice area where, um, uh, when, you know, when authorized payments and finally every day, you know, thousands of payments needs to be what we call settled or captured. That's when actually the fund transfer happens. So that's purely a background task. It does, it's not something client facing or customer facing. These tasks can be kind of, you know, bashed and run when the energy consumption or the thing is low. Okay, so that's another way of kind of, you know, adding or uh, uh, promoting to those towards the sustainability uh, movement. Compute infrastructure. So this is interesting because when we talk about uh, optimization, 
Typically, we talk about cost optimization and performance. I mean, they don't go always together, but we find a balance. Now, we have a sustainability option to consider as well. That kind of complicates the, to, the, the cost and performance a lot. Because in, there are areas where we can't go too short and tune it. Say, for example, your service is a customer-facing service. You, the performance needs to be you know, top-notch, right? You can't compromise on performance there. And then you may need to trade off with the sustainability a bit because you, you, you may be provisioning a bit extra resources or memory and things for those services. So that's why you need to have a balance. But having the sustainability element in the mix helps to you know, uh, kind of broaden the, broaden the discussion or broaden the, um, the, the, the optimization aspects when it comes to uh, your serverless services. Um, I already talked about the granularity. Of course, uh, the compute. Um, use the right compute resources like uh, Lambda, they, they now uh, released the Graviton 2, which is kind of cost efficient as well performance. So these are the things that you need, we need to kind of you know, uh, look for and to manage services. Um, scale to zero is an interesting thing because not all services are you know, scale to zero. Anyone using um, Aurora for serverless? Okay, um, there's, a, there's a debate on Aurora serverless version two, which doesn't scale to zero, right? It stays somewhere there, not all the way here, because that's how it operates. So, so again, there are trade-offs, there are services, so the, you, you, know, you have other benefits, but uh, not always uh, scale to zero. Deployment I talked about, so automation is the key when it comes to deployment. So, automate as much as possible and maximize the utilization of the resources that we kind of use and uh, pipelines and life cycle. Most of the things are you know, kind of known, managed services we already talked about and uh, uh, the, the timely update is what I mean here is like, uh, I, I talk about, I think I wrote a blog post about um, continuous refactoring in serverless is because serverless as a technology along with the cloud is evolving fast. That means new services and new service features are being released every day. So like, you know, I mentioned Graviton now. So that means we need to be prepared to kind of move on incorporating those new features and uh, services that give us the benefit. So that's why, you know, it's important to keep an eye. It's not like, uh, you know, we've done once and we don't touch it for next 10 years. That those days gone. With cloud and serverless, we need to be keep, you know, uh, on, your, on our toes and, uh, you know, updating those things. Right, so the last point I mentioned, creating awareness. What can we do in a big enterprise? Like I mentioned, it's not like a do or don't. It's initially, it's creating the awareness across the teams. So at the Lego group, they you know, obviously talk about plenty of things and uh, plan a promise is one thing. So this is, is not uh, you know, sort of technology per se, but uh, on the other things. And the initiative is already there. So they have the sustainable vision for all the operations and the manufacturing, packaging, all sorts of things. So when it came to technology, so there was, uh, there was a week identified few months ago as a sustainability week. Okay, it was kind of opt-in. It's not compulsory for everyone across the digital technology organization. So we ran a few days with different themes on sustainability. And we kind of, you know, set up the, uh, the debating sessions. We invited external speakers and we share resources and we identify what are the drivers. And uh, we, we set up different topics. So initially, first day was like, okay, what is the sustainability? What, what does it mean when it comes to cloud or technology or uh, social aspects and things like that? And then we you know, di dive deep on, okay, cloud and technology, how does it matter? And then the social responsibilities. So, on these different topics, uh, people came together and they kind of, you know, the, 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 the typical kind of uh, um, the, the brainstorming session or, uh, you know, storyboard session. So ideas came up. So from there, 
identified what are the kind of you know the blockers for the teams. So how can we kind of rectify these things going forward? And um, the what, you know the, the 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 support that we need and um, the. What are the opportunities for the, say for example, in a, in a team? How do you kind of take the message to a normal product squad? Because they are not kind of aware of all these things. They are good at building microservices or serverless services, but uh, when it comes to sustainability, they're not there, right? Like I mentioned the cost and optimization, uh, sorry, performance. They can do that. They can you know, get the tools and run all those things. But when it comes to sustainability, someone needs to trigger their thinking, right? As part of their development or design. So these are the things we talked about and then kind of putting those kind of things slowly into practice. Um, so team awareness, I mentioned, so, so AWS now has a carbon fo footprint, but they need to do more because it now doesn't give you a you know, grand level. What we need to do is, what we need is, we need go granular, say for example, if you, if you have an S3 bucket, we should be able to go down deep and okay, this object in this bucket, you know, what is the impact? Okay, so we should be able to go down deep. I think we'll get there, but it takes time. But these are the things you can easily kind of, you know, uh, expose to your team because it's part of the AWS console and available and slowly, you know, get to that thing. And the other thing is like, um, we do uh, the process called solution design. So before they get developing or implementing anything, they need to go through sort of solution design phase. So this is another opportunity where they can kind of introduce the sustainability aspect part. So in the you know, early days of serverless adoption, I used to insist uh, teams to include uh, some kind of costing session, just to understand the cost aspects of serverless, because otherwise they had no clue whatsoever how much uh, you know, it costs when, it, when, they, when they set up a, you know, a DynamoDB table or a Lambda function, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, can be something you know, added as part of that. And uh, I, I wrote a bunch of blog posts about sustainability as well, especially around serverless. So that's kind of you know good resources. And uh, in addition, so the AWS Cloud shared sustainability model, and the Green Software Foundation is gaining momentum, and the United Nations and a bunch of other uh, places you can find uh, enough information. So to close. Um, the sustainability aspect is, is kind of a journey. It's, it's initially we need to understand and uh, take the message to the teams and slowly uh, start making the trade-offs with the teams and then guiding them and to get the, you know, the, the contribution to the environment. So that's kind of the way I see it. So the way, when we kind of contribute to, to the cloud, on top of what the cloud provider provi provides, so that's how the sustainable movement kind of goes forward. So that's all today. Thank you so much for your time. You. Okay, have we got any questions? Yep. Um, hi, Shane. I was just wondering, you touched on two points, not to ask two separate questions. One is you talked around kind of having a sustainable product in itself, but how do you measure the purpose of that product? Because at the end of the day, if I said to a team, you know, be the most efficient as possible, you could turn everything off. If it served no purpose, then that was the right decision. So how do you really kind of track as this product got a purpose and communicate that to teams? Uh, I'll probably just leave it as that question, I guess. <laughs> no, I, was, I didn't hear that. So. So, so how do you track the purpose of a product? So you could have the most efficient, sustainable service, low cost, but if it serves no purpose, it doesn't deliver anything or it does yeah. something bad, how do you kind of communicate that to the teams? Because it's like, you know, this is your purpose and like this is how you're measuring the outcome really and, and why it's good, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's a good thing. That's, that's why I've been saying that there's no kind of right or wrong or must or must not. It's more of an understanding. And there are obvious situations where the team, you know, can do more of, to a sustainability, right? So, for example, they, they, they provision a bunch of tables, for example, okay? Similar to 
you know, PR branches and stuff, you know, kept open for longer and shutting them down. So these are the early awareness that we need to bring in. So then when they come to scale of operation, so that's a different thing. So that's when all the different best practices and methods come. And best performance product versus sustainability, there is a trade-off, okay? So in certain cases, we need to educate some, sometimes customers. For example, uh, if you are kind of changing your packaging from plastic to paper, you need to first, we need to educate the customers before we can move. So that happens, so that needs to be, so yeah, so there's no kind of, you know, the clean answer, but uh, more. Any of this? No? <laughs> you talked about working in partnership with your cloud provider. Obviously, you're a big yeah. user of AWS. You showed the carbon calculator tool crap thing. Like, I look at that and you see the graph, our journey to 2025 to zero renewable energy. This is where you'll hit zero carbon. Like, are you having conversations with Amazon about how that isn't really the right picture? Because if your data team goes, oh, well, we're going to be carbon neutral in three years. I don't give a crap anymore. That's not really the right message. Uh, and we've got embedded carbon and everything else to think about. <laughs> yeah, so that message happens at a different level. So we kind of, you know, engineering teams come f further down, right? So the cloud enablement team, the enterprise-wide platform scheme, so that level the conversations happen. But we can all put pressure on AWS and cloud provider, right? So compared to other providers, AWS probably not strong in uh, renewable energy usage and things. Everyone has their, uh, you know, promises for 2040, 50, et cetera, et cetera. But we can all put the pressure on. That's how it should be. OK, all right, well, thank you. Um, little applause. Who's left? Thank you.